Yeah, cool. It works. Uh, yeah, I know, okay. but I couldn't see. <laughs> right. Let's try this again. <clears throat> I can't start the recording. That's fine. Trying to get it on full screen. Okay. There we are. <clears throat> right, today is session five, so we sort of bang in the middle of our 10 session course on the legal implications of climate change. Today's topic is enforcing climate law. So we've come to a point where we know what the international legal framework is. We have analysed the obligations of states under that and classified it according to its different strengths. Um, we need to now look at how the law is performing. So the natural recourse for enforcing the law is if there is a breach or if there's a perceived breach, then you go to court and you enforce the law saying this party has an obligation towards me, towards the world, towards another entity uh, for doing something and they haven't done it. OK, so um, we will be looking today at how climate law is being enforced through adjudicatory procedures in courts, etc. But before I go into today's topic, I wanted to talk a little bit about the United Nations General Assembly Resolution, which was passed in 1970. You might wonder, why am I talking about that? Well, it's a bit of background as to what motivates me to teach you guys. You know, you're so far away from where I am. You belong to a different institution. So what motivates me? What motivates me as a public international lawyer is to see some of the principles of public international law having an impact in the real world. So this United Nations General Assembly resolution is on the uh, principles of international law concerning friendly relations and cooperation among states in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations. As those of you who have studied public international law know, that the foundation for modern international law is the Charter of the United Nations. So international law in peacetime is really founded through the Charter of the United Nations. And on the 25th anniversary of the founding of the UN through the Charter of the United Nations, this declaration concerning friendly relations and cooperation among states was adopted in the General Assembly. Now, this is considered as one of the principles of international law, i.e. maintaining friendly relations, having friendly relations and cooperation, you know, as a result of being friends, friendly nations among these states. So it's quite important to, in our own way, to ensure that these relations or this principle of international law is uh, progressed and furthered. Yeah. Whatever circumstances might actually be. So, the reason why friendly relations and cooperation is necessary is it because it strengthen, strengthens world peace. That's why the 1970 UN General Assembly Declaration constitutes a development that is a landmark development in international law. So. I'm very grateful that, you know, the two countries that I belong to enable me to do the work that I do. So that's the groove in which I want to um, take this further. I mean, I'm here. I'm a citizen of the UK. So friendly relation between the UK and Russia at the moment. There's a lot of anger between the states. So there, you know, this anger has to really subside. It's really important that 
those of us who can reach out to each other do in the way that we are doing right now. I'm talking to you there. You are talking to me here. We're learning together. We are building a relationship. So at the moment, unfortunately, that's where that stands. The other country that I belong to, I happen to be an overseas citizen of India. So friendly relations between India and Russia. Now that's taken a different turn in the last few years. I was recently watching a, a YouTube video, which is what um, prompted me to share it with you as well. It's quite an instructive uh, perspective on India-Russia relations. It was um, an event that took place in December 2023. I've given you the link there. It gets you to think about, you know, how countries can behave with each other. And consequently, people from countries. Now, we are all are in very different positions. I have many of you here who are from one country but are studying there in Moscow. Uh, I have students amongst you, those who are from Moscow or who are from Russia, um, have come out and studied as well. Um, so we have an understanding of you know, relations between people of different countries. So from that perspective, we do have an obligation to you know, deepen and continuously understand um, each other's countries a bit more. So I'm taking this opportunity um, to, to ask you, you know, to um, consider relations between states, how we could go, go back or, you know, carry on with the friendly relations that we have between the countries in question that I've mentioned. Right, so in that context, how many of you would like to come to the UK? Let me hear a few voices. I want to hear from someone I haven't heard so far. Let me call you out. I have got Jusija. I don't remember seeing you before. Have you come under a different name? Um, yeah, hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Professor. Hello. So, have you been to the UK? Would you like to come to the UK? No, I have, I've never been to UK, but I'd like to come to UK. Mm -hmm. What do you know about the UK? What do you like about the UK? Um, I know that the weather in UK is much the same as Moscow. It's always uh, uh, cloudy and... Uh, <laughs> Rain. <laughs> <laughs> you have a good measure of it, yes. <laughs> so then why do you still want to come here? <laughs> <laughs> what do you like about the UK? Uh, well, I think I like the building in the UK. Um, ah. Yeah, I like it too. A lot of our buildings are very cottage-like buildings, correct? Yeah. Anything else? How will it benefit you by coming here and being here? Well, I think I I can take a lot of good pictures. <laughs> <laughs> well, for just uh, tourism, I think it's a tourism. good place to stay for for a few weeks. Yeah, good. Well, let's hope you make it someday. Good luck with that. <laughs> I have a hand up. Um, is that who is that? Because it's written in Cyrillic. Whoever has the hand up, yes. Uh, Siddharth. Uh, oh, Siddharth, right. Uh, uh ma'am, uh, uh, I don't know about to, uh, wanting to go to Britain, but I think in India there is a huge hype of going to. Britain, Canada, and US, and I think the main hype is uh, either for getting financial stability or getting good education. So I think if I if I want to go to Britain, so mainly the two very respected institutions are London like School of Economics and uh, let's say Oxford. So uh, hope someday, if possible, we might be able to attend some summer school or some student exchange program there. 
hope so that's what i wanted to if possible go britain for mm-hmm. so you want to come here and learn yes 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 sir. so why did you go to russia because the systems of law are quite different india and russia they are more similar between uk and india yes uh, um, uh, one of the thing was the procedures for applying here were also quite simple and uh, they made it very cost effective for us in a way that uh, we can afford the education but at the same time it cannot it does not create much financial burden also so we don't have to take a loan or something so the income which we are generating through online jobs or something it's uh, very well enough for us to what you say go through our monthly expenses but in mm. uk or let's say you it goes very out of budget and the scholarship is also limited and the other reason was also i love russia so the one reason i wanted to come here was also because of that so you are there on a one year course or longer a uh, two years course ma'am this is a two years course the ah, masters years. Okay. of national trade and dispute resolution yes. yeah <laughs> i think it's a very wise decision to go to somewhere where it's cost effective i have seen so many of my students over here um, they come here the lure of you know the british education which you know uh, i don't doubt gives value but it's still quite uh, expensive and the scholarships are less so yeah um, so it's a good uh, wise choice um, you enjoying it there Uh, yes of course it has its own benefits and hardships but still uh, so far i am enjoying and it's a nice journey here right are there as much okay. of home comfort uh, over there as indian students experience here in the uk you can get the whole country in london i don't know how it is in russia <laughs> <laughs> i don't know the other students might be able to explain it more we have just been in moscow and not different parts so i don't know the russian students yeah, so might be very much is moscow as yeah. sort of international as london or do you get restaurants from around the world what happens there um uh i think uh, there are restaurants there are two indian restaurants possibly but uh, uh, there are mostly restaurants from different countries like let's say italian restaurants or i have not been into much uh, uh, i have just been into two or three restaurants so far so and mm-hmm. those were also russian so it creates a confusion as to what to order in the restaurant so <laughs> yeah so far we have like the process of learning is it see how much we learn in coming days <laughs> nice it sounds adventurous <laughs> i somehow feel if you come from india to the uk you won't have as much of an adventure so <laughs> this sounds adventurous <laughs> thank you sir <laughs> mm-hmm. nice um parida parida shittu Hello, Professor. Good evening. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um. So the question is. Have you been? Is, uh, Have you been to the UK? No, not really. I haven't. Mm-hmm. I tried to, like, so All right. much. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So when I graduated last year, I applied to some schools. and pretty much got to most got into most of them but the the scholarship options were very limited and the prices mm-hmm. were so high yeah yeah when i've been in the last for the past five years then i enjoy it so it was just pretty wise for me to go to hsc because it's like an international school and it has a very good reputation also mm-hmm. and yeah so are you which course are you doing law or some other course yeah. law law of international trade and dispute resolution right okay yeah. what's your uh, first degree background in international relations international relations international relations all oh, right okay yeah. and where's that from this university as well hsc no in another city varanasi state university but in in russia also Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, good luck. Hope in the future you might get an opportunity. 
I hope so too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Who else have I not heard from? Maybe not Javid. Javid Mohammed. Hello. Good evening, Professor. Hello. Uh, good evening, Professor. Good evening. What are uh, you studying? Yeah. Are you doing a law Just, masters? Yes, sir. I'm also a law graduate and studying a masters in international trade law and dispute resolution. Mm -hmm. And your first degree doesn't sound like your first degree was in Russia. I'm from Pakistan and I have done my bachelor's from Pakistan too. OK, did you practice as well after your bachelor's? Uh, I practice criminal law because you mm -hmm. know in our countries, uh, uh, the scope of law is like more tends toward the criminal law. So I mm. practice for one year uh, after my degree, but uh, after my degree, mm -hmm. I'm looking for a program, especially some international university. So so that I get an admission here and I move down. Mm -hmm. Well, for you as well, the law is very different between Pakistan and the Russian Federation, right? One is civil law, another is common law. Yeah, Pakistan but is also common international law, international. isn't it? Right, but uh, we are studying international law, so it's pretty same. Okay, yeah. Advantage of studying international law. Excellent. Right, so would you like to come and study in the UK at some point? Or something else? <laughs> I'm planning to have my PhD from UK. If they accept my master's degree from HSE, then. OK. Yeah, I mean, there's no reason why they shouldn't. You have a master's degree and you have a master's degree. You just have to write a really good proposal. Everything hangs on that, whether you find a research gap. Yeah, so you have to do yeah. the work to develop a proposal, unlike you know, like undergraduate degree and postgraduate degree, you just fill in the application, you give your basic details. But for a PhD degree, it's different. You already have to show that there is a research question that's worth researching and you have to tell them how you're going to do it. And you have to make the effort to identify a supervisor who has research strengths. And you have to do a lot of work before you apply. So that's the key for, you know, getting some positive results. Uh, from UK universities if you apply for a PhD anywhere here. You are right there so far the best, but uh, uh, currently our university is under sanctions. That's why I'm pretty worried. Mm -hmm. OK, right. And finally, let me speak to. Is it Jashu? Jashu Wang? I believe Wang will be your second name, isn't it? Hello, Jashu. You're there? No? Right. Looks like I'm missing my um, camera friend today. Tamar Len usually is on camera. Nobody, none of you are. He usually is. Doesn't look like he's here today. Right, okay. Anyone else want to talk about how they might be a part of promoting friendly relations between states? Hello, Professor. This is Zahud from Pakistan. Hello? Zahud? Zahud? Uh, Yes, uh, being a Pakistan, uh, the more we need to develop friendly relationship with India. And I think we, we Pakistan, should work on that. There's a lot of disturbance from your side, so it's not easy to grasp what you're talking. Uh, am I audible now? Ah, yeah, perfect. I think uh, being a Pakistani, uh, we, we should work on friendly relationship with India, and also Indians should work on people-to-people -people contact and friendly relationship and cooperation.
India and Pakistan. The relations are very tense and very uh, political and diplomatic tensions are going on. Mm -hmm. Agree. All countries need to go over and above the conflict, the geopolitics and stick to or always keep an avenue open for friendly relations. Right, because that's the only way we're going to survive in the long run. Yeah, that's the only key. Yeah, there's no point <laughs> in the face of climate change and other planetary crisis for us to not have friendly relations. Doesn't sound like a smart, you know, move by humanity. Right, right. Thanks, Ahur, for that. OK, off we go. So the structure for today's lecture. Just to remind yourself, we're going to look at where does the world stand with respect to Article 2 of the Paris Agreement, which is to keep the global average temperature at less than two degrees Celsius uh, increase or aiming to keep it at 1.5 degrees Celsius. We'll look at, we'll have some idea of the climate litigation, we'll have an overview of it, look at some cases and then come back to the question about what are the implication of, of these cases and climate litigation for Article 2 of the Paris Agreement and then look at what is the future of climate litigation. <clears throat> so Article 2 needs to be implemented. That's the overall aim of the Paris Agreement, right? Where do we stand? Well, climate ambition around the world remains inadequate. So this is a reminder for us that the policies and laws that have flowed from the Paris Agreement of 2015 still takes us to a global average temperature rise of 2.7 degrees Celsius. So that's what we mean when we say that climate ambition around the world remains inadequate in order to fulfill Article 2 of the Paris Agreement. We're not saying there have not been any improvements despite these improvements in countries mitigation and adaptation targets. So despite their efforts under Article 4, Article 7, still inadequate. Despite numerous corporate pledges to achieve net zero emissions. Yeah, so the behavior of corporate organizations is what is mainly sought to be regulated under mitigation adaptation plans. Yeah, those are the big wins that we can get. So these two actors, one is the big uh, emitters, the actors, the corporate sector, and the second is the policies that will help shape the behavior of corporate sector, which is laid out by the public sector. So both have been taking efforts, uh, no doubt about it, but nevertheless, it still falls short. So, what do we do? You know, the small people, what do we do then? So in response to this, in response to Article 2, in response to the government's and corporate's response to Article 2, individuals, children, youth, women, human rights groups, communities, indigenous groups, non-governmental organization, business entities, as well as national and subnational governments, like city governments, have turned to dispute resolution with the governments who are obliged to implement Article 2 of the Paris Agreement. So that's what we're going to look at. What is the shape and the nature of climate litigation under Article 2? So this is strictly not within the scope of, you know, um, one area of law or the other, right? So dispute resolution can occur in all different areas. So that's what we're trying to look at to see what sort of laws have been 
um, uh, implicated, used in the context of trying to get closer to Article 2 of Paris Agreement. And that's the really interesting bits. OK, so today we're not going going to go into detailed analysis of all of the case law because that's not going to be possible to do before we get a hang of what is the place of climate litigation within the implementation of Article 2 Paris Agreement. So it's going to be a quite a novel approach of looking at case law. It's not a black letter approach to looking at case law but it is trying to get the whole big picture about climate cases, climate litigation around the world to draw some conclusions in order to look at how an international treaty is being implemented. What are the pathways for implementation for international treaties? Right, so those of you who are lawyers, who are you know, studying dispute resolution, you're gonna have to shift your mindset and your attitude a bit to, um, you know, from black letter legal analysis to understanding, well, what is the big deal about climate, about any kind of dispute resolution? Yeah. So think about the questions like who does dispute resolution serve? Yeah. If party A brings a case against party B, uh, it's fair to say that uh, these are the two parties that directly benefit from it. But then there's also cases um, that go beyond the benefit of the two parties or that bring around ripple benefits. So you're going to have to cast your mind to uh, that sort of a litigation. Uh, and then you've got litigation where, uh, you know, public law litigation, where you're saying the government hasn't carried out its obligation. What we'll see today is a mix of both these types of litigation. OK. So what has the benefits of litigation been um, when it comes to climate litigation? In the main, the real benefits seem to be towards just transition. Right. So. In the implementation of the Paris Agreement, there are very many different aspects, including emissions reduction, but then there is the just transition, how people are affected by this international climate treaty, because at the end of the day, the aim of the climate treaty is not to bring benefits directly to people. The aim is to bring benefits to humanity as a whole by making sure that the climate system is protected enough. But within that, the main benefits so far of litigation seem to be directly to the parties. OK, parties to the litigation, not parties to the Paris Agreement. OK, parties to the Paris Agreement are only states and nations, but in litigation, you come down to individuals as well. Because parties have been able to put forward innovative arguments and connections between a specific greenhouse gas emitters action and global climate change. So when you look at the Paris Agreement, it doesn't point the finger at any specific entity that we can recognize. What it does say, though, is that there are obligations on all of the states that are parties, whereas through litigation. There have been arguments that can connect one specific greenhouse gas emitter. OK, and global climate change, because as you know, if you are claiming for harm, there needs to be an entity uh, against whom you can claim that harm uh, or claim remediation for that harm. It's not possible for the environment as a whole to come and give you remedy. So you do need to identify someone. And the state is not going to be the right entity to point your finger at because the state is not an emitter. The state, of course, has some role in emissions. Its, its operations do uh, give rise to emissions, but they are not the main culprits. Yeah. So there are other organizations whose um, products, whose operations contributes much more to emissions, greenhouse gas emissions than a state does. So in this case, a specific greenhouse gas emitters actions and linking them to global climate change. OK. And how foreseeable climate driven impacts can be linked to specific harm suffered by the plaintiffs. So now we're talking about the future. OK, so we have data in our hands. 
we have predictions, we have models, and they have all been internationally agreed upon as well. And given that we know what's going to happen in the future, specific harms can be linked to what might happen in the future as well. So this again is uh, a novel benefit that the harm has not actually occurred, but since it can be foreseen, the plaintiffs or the parties who have filed the case can then legitimately are allowed to say that we know this is going to happen, therefore you're going to have to uh, remedy, provide a remedy for this. Okay, so it's so the main benefits of litigation uh, really surround this area. So what influence has climate litigation got on Article 2 of the Paris Agreement? The latest uh, report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the sixth assessment report, it recognized for the very first time, and with medium confidence, it is not highly confident. Okay. So the IPCC takes a scientific approach about establishing a causal link between um, a phenomenon and its cause. Okay. And sometimes it can be very sure about the cause and the result of it. If that's the case, then they would say with full confidence about something. But in the case of looking at the influence of um, climate litigation on Article 2, they are saying with medium confidence that climate litigation has influenced the outcome and ambition of climate governance. Now, this is a really big statement. Because what this means is we are in the right direction. So climate litigation is a tool to get to Article 2 Paris Agreement. And we should have more of such litigation in order to go from medium confidence that IPCC is professing to having a high confidence in this type of mechanism to influence the ambition, to up the ambition of climate governance uh, with the parties, the Paris Agreement. So that's what we can deduce from this. And what IPCC also identified was that climate in, uh, litigation was an important avenue for actors to influence climate policy outside of the formal UNFCCC processes. So the UNFCCC processes, we, we're already acquainted with it. We know what happens on a yearly basis. That is the meeting of the parties. Uh, in the COPs, and we know how it's structured, uh, what sort of items go on the agenda, how decisions are taken, etc. So given that this is the case, this is a formal UNFCCC. But using climate litigation is a effective way of more people having more influence on this target and this goal set out by the Paris Agreement. That is definitely good news that we've got uh, more than the avenue of the uh, Conference of Parties, because we know they take place, uh, you know, in one part of the world once a year, 10 to 14 days. Of course, work goes on in between, but they are strictly regulated by the uh, processes laid out in the rule book and related uh, instruments. How international negotiations take place, there's a very uh, specific groove to it. Whereas the climate litigation is definitely another important avenue by which actors, including those who have um, obligations and uh, powers within the UNFCCC, they also could be using these avenues, but more importantly, it is being used by uh, individuals and uh, non-governmental actors uh, and subnational actors as well. So, the main um, the main document that I recommend you to read is this publication from the United Nations Environmental Program which is one of the uh, UN organization 
And as the name suggests, it relates to uh, protection of the environment. They have been publishing status reports on global climate litigation. This is the third status report they have published. And a lot of the material that I'm dealing with today uh, comes from this report. The director of UNEP said the following. She said, people are increasingly turning to courts to combat the climate crisis. They're holding governments and the private sector accountable and making litigation a key mechanism for securing climate action and promoting climate justice. So two key themes we have already come across. So when we say climate action, we mean action by governments in terms of mitigation adaptation and promoting climate justice. We mean such policies on mitigation adaptation, on um, uh, providing compensation for loss and damage, uh, etc., has to be in a way that it takes account of people and their interests. Okay? It has to be just and it has to be fair. So this is more about the individuals per se. So to provide an overview, in the second report that UNEP produced on climate litigation, global climate litigation, it listed around 884 cases in 2017. And by 2022, that had risen to about 2,180 cases. We'll see a graphic in a little bit looking at the breakdown of where these cases are coming from. And you do get a global picture of climate litigation. However, most of the cases are in the US, as you might expect, for various reasons. It's quite uh, common to use litigation as a means uh, to achieve one's purposes in the US. It's quite a litigious society, and in this case, it looks like it might bring us benefits overall. Um, also, there's, um, there's more economic power. You can hire lawyers, you can pay lawyers. So there's a number of factors why there are more, the most number of cases with respect to uh, in climate litigation. And I you know, can safely also say that this will be the case not just for climate litigation, but also for other types of litigation. So it's not um, an unusual trend. Um, uh, what is also good to see is that the cases in other parts of the world are also increasing. So in the 2022 report, approximately about 17% of the cases um, are in developing countries, including in the small island developing states. As we saw in the last lecture, um, cli climate law is now creating this category of countries that are highly vulnerable because of climate change, a category in international law that didn't exist before, but it has come into existence now. So it's important to also note what's happening in the small island developing states, as they are the ones that are most threatened in, um, from climate change. Where are these cases being filed? Um, all types of bodies, really. This report is counted by 65 bodies worldwide. They could be international courts, they could be regional courts, they could be national courts, they can be tribunals, quasi-judicial bodies, other types of adjudicatory bodies, including special procedures of the UN, including under the UNFCC, and arbitration tribunals. So if you like, it's the whole gamut of dispute resolution bodies that are being engaged with climate litigation. Now we can draw a number of conclusions from that for law and the development of law. The fact that climate change law is permeating so many different areas of law, and this ties back to what I started this course with saying to identify rules for uh, climate change, you don't, you can't just restrict yourself to one area of international law, right? And the same goes to say that you cannot restrict it even to one area of municipal law. 
And that's just reflected by the number of different uh, adjudicatory bodies that are being engaged with cases that can directly fall under the definition of climate litigation. Um, so the I won't go into the methodology um, by which the cases are classified as climate litigation because um, it has uh, it does exclude uh, cases where the benefits for climate policy is only incidental. So let's say that it's a case has occurred in a court um, for the violation of an environmental uh, um, provision, something like pollution. And as a result of which they, you know, there is an order to shut down that polluting uh, factory or unit that obviously will also have an impact on the greenhouse gas emissions that that factory emits through its operations or through its products even. Yeah, I mean, in the process of production of the products. Uh, that wouldn't that is not counted as a um, climate change litigation, although the benefits are incidental. Yeah, there is clear reduction of emissions that come comes because you close that factory. So that's about methodology of what you what kind of cases would you classify as climate litigation? Um, but we might want to consider that it still brings benefit, you know, in terms of emissions reduction. Um, so that there are other cases as well, which um, work in favor of the aims that are uh, part of uh, the climate, UN climate regime. So let's look at the causes of action. Yeah. What are the causes of action that have led to um, climate law being implicated? So there are cases that rely on human rights, either enshrined in international law or in national constitutions. Then there are challenges that have been brought to court uh, as a result of domestic non-enforcement of climate related laws and policies. Then you have litigants that are seeking to keep the fossil fuels in the ground. So this is all especially around extraction of fossil fuels. Advocates for greater climate disclosures and an end to greenwashing. So greenwashing is when there is a claim to say we have reduced emissions, but it is not necessarily clear that they actually have reduced it. So it's a um, it's a way of uh, fraudulent behavior to say that to claim or to overclaim uh, what the emitter is doing. So there have been cases questioning uh, this approach. And to give more data, climate disclosures, what are your emissions? How do they come from? What changes have you made um, for you know, moving from what you said uh, you would do uh, to what you've actually done? So great, greater transparency. Claims addressing corporate liability and responsibility for climate harms. Yeah. So pointing out who the emitters are and looking for liability, because that would be the obvious way in which you would be able to get redress once you have attached liability to corporate activity. <clears throat> Claims addressing failures to adapt to the impacts of climate change. So this is around adaptation to say there's not enough policies, there's not enough action um, with respect to adaptation. So that's a failure of responsibility. So these are the different causes of action that have been used to in climate litigation. So. Let's look at this graphic. That total number of 2000 plus cases breaks down jurisdictionally, state by state like this. So these that the report I was talking to you about is um, looking at cases up until the 31st of December 2022. Okay. So 1,522 cases, that's about 70% of the cases in the United States of America. And then coming next to it is Australia with 127. The United Kingdom with 79. 
European Union, 62. Germany, 38. 34 in Canada, 30 in Brazil, 26 in New Zealand, 22 in France, 18 in Mexico, 17 in Spain, 12 in Indonesia, 12 cases in the European Court of Human Rights, 11 cases in India, 11 cases in the UNFCCC, 10 cases in Argentina, nine cases in Colombia, nine cases in Poland, nine again in South Africa, nine cases in ICSID. Does anyone know what ICSID is? Dispute resolution people. International, International Center for the Settlement of the Investment Disputes. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you very much. Yeah. So that's in relation to international investment. Seven cases in Chile, seven in the Netherlands, six in Italy, six in Pakistan, five in Belgium, five in Japan, and five in the regional inter-American system of human rights. Four cases in Ireland, and then there's three cases in Austria, Czech, Ecuador, Guyana, Philippines, Korea, Switzerland, the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, interesting forum for adjudication, three cases submitted to the United Nations Special Procedure, the Special Rapporteurs, Special Rapporteur Human Rights, Rights Development, uh, Special Rapporteur for the Rights of the Child, three cases in the World Trade Organization Dispute Settlement Body, and then two cases in China, Denmark, Kenya, Nigeria, Norway, Sweden, Turkey, Uganda, Ukraine, two in the International Court of Justice, two with the United Nations Human Rights Committee, one case in the Russian Federation, one in Slovenia, Thailand, the East African Court of Justice, the European Committee of Social Rights, the International Criminal Court, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, the Permanent Court of Arbitration, the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, and then uh, there's a special procedure case directly to the United Nations Secretary General, and then there's one case in Estonia, Finland, Luxembourg, Nepal, Papua New Guinea, and Peru. Okay, so. What thoughts and comments have you got on the spread of cases? Any observations from looking at this graphic? Anyone, you can mute and speak. Sorry, I meant you can unmute and speak. <laughs> All right, Professor. I um, I Hello. observe that um, there are mm -hmm. different um firms, different um adjudicatory bodies. So mm -hmm. um, it's not limited to um a certain kind of adjudicatory body. For instance, I can see ICSID is involved. Um, ICSID is um, mm -hmm. okay. From my own understanding, I believed ICSID was just mm -hmm. limited to investment disputes specifically, mm. but. Looking at this, it's changing my um, view about this. And I can also see there are cases also in the European Court of Human Rights. Mm. And um, so I, 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 always, I was almost asking if um, um, these um, cases, this, sorry, these forums, these particular adjudicatory bodies um, determine, are determined by um, the kind of claims um, <clears throat> that are brought um, mm. in respect of climate change. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, because they only have jurisdiction for certain areas of law and you can only bring certain types of action there, right? So that's what it is. Uh, so human rights, we look to see how, uh, you know, uh, with the warming climate, uh, agricultural production is uh, lowering and therefore 
uh, you know, the cost of food is increasing. So what does that mean for right to food, for example? So there is a right to food that you know the United the International Covenant on Social, uh, Economic and Cultural Rights provides for. So that's the sort of stuff that could come around in human rights. Of course, not in the European Court of Human Rights because the European Convention on Human Rights isn't, doesn't talk about the right to food. But it could talk about the uh, uh, right to family life, for example. Yeah. Um, so it's about using these causes of actions to be able to achieve climate ends and the same with the investment disputes um i don't think i'm covering any of the investment cases today but i'll be interested to see if you can do the research and tell me what these nine cases in exit are but you know decision to invest or let's say you know channeling the, the foreign direct investment might go into opening uh, a, a new mine, uh, let's say of lithium, uh, given that we all need, um, you know, batteries for our uh, electric vehicles, um, or we need um, uh, other, uh, you know, rare earth metals, for example, for our mobile phones uh, to work. So investment, uh, might now need to take into account what is the impact of um, development using that um, foreign uh, money, so the foreign direct investment for developing these um, kind of products, right? So to put it in a highly simplistic way, but to get you thinking about what is the interrelationship between you know, investment uh, dispute settlement and how might it help achieve the gain, the goals of the Paris Agreement. Yeah, I mean, each of these um, in itself needs a lot of research, as you can, you know, imagine. And as you uh, seem to rightly also be thinking in the direction, you know, wondering, yeah, how can some of these forums come to use in the context of climate litigation? Any other thoughts from anyone? Yeah, Have I think uh, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. looking just looking at the figures, like you mentioned, you rightly said, you can see that uh, the United States is leading, and it is obvious why because uh, it tells the amount of uh, emissions or climate related issues that are going in that country. Not only with that, but you can also see that people are aware of the various. Uh, litigations that are there for them to go through. Mm -hmm. uh, you may be surprised, maybe, I don't know if, I guess if you do research very well, you also understand that the lower cases in uh, maybe some of the developing countries does not mm -hmm. necessarily mean that they don't emit much. It is lack mm. of awareness. In mm. as much as lack of awareness is one, and number two, people uh, like... Uh, I mentioned the last time relating to uh, Lawrence's uh, memo on uh, mm -hmm. trading emissions. Many mm -hmm. of these people in uh, the developing countries are seriously looking for ways and means of getting food on the table, ending poverty, battling with mm. these uh, uh, little diseases, malaria, and other stuff. So mm. issues of change is something they don't even know about. They know that the climate is uh, climate change mm. is happening. But they don't even have the time and the luxury to go to court. To, they want to find something to eat. So lower cases in these places doesn't mean, uh, oh, there they are no issues. They are still developing. No, mm. there are issues with climate change. But the, the, the difference between them and maybe the developed world is that uh, in as much as the developed world have the time and are very much aware of the laws governing or the litigations governing emissions and all that. The developing mm. world, some of some countries specifically, are not uh, privy to uh, what to do when you see some of these things, and that is why you see the lower cases in some of these developing. And countries. these cases might also be adaptation rather than you know mitigation, like you said. Most definitely. The, most definitely. You know they're not high emitters, so they're not as much the cause of the problem. Um, a lot of the emissions that come from there are probably could be classified as unavoidable given their national circumstances, right? Um, 
but um, the cases might be an adaptation because it could be uh, looking at any part of the um, um, uh, Paris Agreement. Uh, and it also will have a ripple effects then on uh, mitigation because if the you know governments in least developed countries or developing countries um, are wrapped in the knuckle for not having good adaptation plans and not giving it you know proper thought and proper resourcing, um, then when they are you know in their international relations with the countries that are high emitters, they're not going to accept compromises which might you know not benefit them in some way. So it could potentially have a ripple effect. I mean, research needs to be done about what the impact actually is. The IPCC report does talk about mm, some of these ripple effects in terms of, you know, what is the power of climate litigation? Um, so it may be, for example, the two cases uh, that I can see here in, um, uh, in Nigeria, for example. Uh, it could be perhaps based on the, um, I mean, there's a long history of environmental cases in Nigeria because of the kind of damage that happens to livelihoods in the Delta states, as well as the um, environmental damage in Delta states. And that could easily be escalated to um, uh, to, to climate as well. So um, there could be all sorts of um, issues that flow from all parts of the uh, UNFCC regime. OK. Any other thoughts? Anything you found interesting? There's 127 cases in Australia. There's one case in the Russian Federation. The interesting point is like, uh, uh, and the Russia is a big country, there's a big federation. Uh, however, the case file is only one, and uh, in Australia there are 127 cases. So mm. I think there is a huge, huge, there is a huge gap. Yeah, I mean both of the both Australia and Russian Federation, they have quite a lot of resources. You know, Australia also has a lot of natural resources. Russia also there's some similarities in the profile of the countries, I think. Same with China. Two cases in China, again, a country that's endowed with a lot of resources, a lot of resources very relevant to the um, uh, energy transition required. Yeah. Well, you guys have your job cut out. You're studying in the Russian Federation, so if you're interested, you should look for avenues by which you can. Um, use the courts as a mechanism to get some clarity on you know what the level of obligations type of obligations uh, there are um, in uh, at the national level at the subnational level uh, in russia uh, and that's the case with you know all of the countries we barely have clarity around what the subnational obligations are yeah, and we also don't have as much powers given to different levels of governance in order to be uh, able to discharge responsibilities. And we'll see in a few uh, case law how some cities are also pointing this out quite clearly. OK, so. So I think like uh, the diversity of uh, forum in this uh, chart reflects like the complexity of addressing the climate change. Mm. Totally agree with you. Right. Let's see how we get there now. <laughs> Sorry, you were going to say something? Uh, no, I, I, I was just adding the point like th th there is a complexity in addressing the climate change, climate change issue. And also like uh, the, the, all the other laws are, are intertwined. So the, the, mm. the complexity and the intertwining of the legal system and the legal complexity make it uh, the chart appear like this. Absolutely, that's what it is quite exciting to study this area of law because you know it's complex and there's lots of challenges. So um, it's, a, it's a good area to you know write your dissertation in. It's a good area to pick a PhD topic in for sure, you know. Because there's enough scope for new innovative 
ideas to develop around law and litigation. Excellent. All right. So um, you can think more about it um, once you've catch hold of the slides later. Right, so some of these cases. There's one set of cases known as the climate rights cases. Now, climate rights, it kind of easily rolls off the tongue, but it's not a real category as yet. OK, it's very much built on the back of human rights. Uh, but let's see what is this new concept of climate rights that's coming or that's taking shape. So climate rights encompass the ways in which national constitution, human rights laws and other laws in general imbue individuals and communities with the right to climate mitigation and climate adaptation action. So this is an interesting shift. So instead of directly saying that, you know, provide me with the right to food, what a national constitution which recognizes, you know, the right to uh, food, a socioeconomic right, you use that right in the constitution or in the human rights legislation of that country, which either has developed its own its human rights legislation or is implementing international human rights, you know, the covenants. You use that to shape the action of governments in its mitigation and adaptation policy and law. So these are essentially climate rights are actions that assert the insufficient climate mitigation or adaptation, which violates these claimants, these plaintiff rights. And some of the climate rights are around the right to life, the right to health, food, water, liberty, family life, healthy environment, a safe climate, and more. So climate right cases have all been based around these different rights that are already existing. So are a question we can ask from an analyt analytical point of view is by creating this new category of climate rights, is that an illustration of the problem of fragmentation in international law? So in international, in public international law, we address this issue, we address this fundamental issue saying, do we have too many categorization and specializations? So is that, and that's not such a good thing. So when we say fragmentation of international law, it's always a bit critical saying, can we not consolidate? Yeah, but otherwise it becomes a bit too much. So one way of looking at this newly forming climate rights category is by addressing it as being part of the problem of fragmentation in international law. But another way of looking at it is, well, they are quite clearly a distinct category of rights that are unique and necessary in the epoch of the Anthropocene. So we're taking into context a normative environment known as the emergence of the Anthropocene. I'll take you back to that first session where I introduced to you the concept of Anthropocene. So I said, from a geological point of view, the Earth is moving from the period or the epoch of the Holocene into the Anthropocene. And Anthropocene is called that because humanity as a whole has a role in shaping the physical characteristics of the Earth. Yeah. So we have become very powerful. If that is the case, then we need to be looking at human activity from a vastly different perspective. You know, it's not just about private rights or it's not, you know, human activity doesn't just, just affect human society. It affects something way be beyond. And maybe the step towards, you know, going beyond is by looking at new concepts and new principles in law. So maybe climate rights is justified from that perspective. So. Um, Whichever way you would like to argue for it, the jury is still out on what these are and whether there's even a category of climate rights, but you get a picture of what we mean when we say climate rights. And the obligations pertaining to climate rights can fall into three main categories. They could be substantive obligations. Okay, so obligations of result. 
So we looked at climate change law and we said the Paris Agreement uh, takes two approaches. One is obligations of conduct, which is the procedural obligations. You've got to be transparent. You've got to create an NDC. You've got to create a target. But there are also substantive obligations. You have to act upon these targets and achieve net zero, right? So that is the obligation of result. And obligations relating to persons and groups in vulnerable situations. So this is where you get international law. There are no obligations directly to individuals. Yeah. If I, as a citizen of the United Kingdom, is harmed by someone else, I can only go through my government to question another government. OK, so uh, however, when it comes to climate rights, there may be direct personhood given to individuals. Yeah, and that's the obligations relating to persons and groups in vulnerable situations. Um, and while we're discussing this area of different types of climate cases, we also have to bear in mind that dispute resolution mechanisms do not always deal with all the disputes that exist in that area, right? Because many cases are still not brought to the courts because of financial challenges. There could be intimidation. There could also be a lack of know-how. You know, we already saw it's a very complex picture. I mean, even lawyers practicing in national courts don't really consider um, climate rights as a route um, for, you know, uh, uh, helping their clients um, when they file a case, right? So lack of know-how can be existing in all levels um, of uh, institutions which connect to the law, you know, uh, right from practicing lawyers to, le you know, legal academia, as well as uh, judges and government institutions, the executive. Yeah, so it is still um, quite a new uh, area, especially looking at it from the point of view of uh, the global scenario. So let's just look at some of the cases. Yeah, mm, it's by no means the whole corpus of 2000 cases, but um, I'm going to give you a flavor of the different cases. Sachi and Argentina case okay, so that came up in 2021. So 16 children from Argentina, Brazil, France, Germany, Turkey claimed that their rights were violated. Their rights under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child were violated because their governments were making insufficient cuts to greenhouse gas emissions. Now, the outcome of this case it, this, this was international, so it was before the um, committee uh, established under the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The petitions were actually dismissed. The reason was more technical. It was a failure to exhaust domestic remedies. So as we know in dispute resolution, you need to exhaust domestic remedies before you can come up before the United Nations, uh, sorry, before uh, an international forum. So domestic remedies were not exhausted. However, this is what is the evolving jurisprudence with respect to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. It clarified what children's rights are in the context of climate change. So the UN committee found that potential harm of the states, acts or omissions, so omission to lay a policy or, uh, or an act of not fulfilling the policy or not even laying out a policy regarding the carbon emissions was reasonably foreseeable to the states. Yeah. So you've got to know that the harm is possible and the harm is possible because of what you do and not or what you omit to do. The second thing it confirmed was the state's carbon emissions actively contribute to the harmful effects of climate change. And these are not limited to emissions within the state boundaries. Because principles in environmental law basically say you cannot pollute or the person next to you, the person, the people around you cannot be affected. So if you're in your property, if you're burning wood, then that should not go to the next property. Similarly, at countries level, 
But then we had the trail smelt arbitration and other cases which then uh, introduced the concept of transboundary pollution. But then more recently, you've got the International Law Commission's articles on uh, degradation of the atmosphere or protection, uh, an obligation by states to protect the atmosphere. However, the ILC articles are not binding. Okay. However, we can see that in customary law, in international law, you're getting this idea that damaging the climate or damaging the atmosphere as a whole, not just transboundary pollution, is also an international wrong that states can commit. So we've moved now in that jurisprudence, which is now what is being confirmed in the context of the uh, uh, looking at the rights of children um, uh, and, and what the states owe them. Um, so that's the second uh, principle that was affirmed by the committee. And third, the petitioners had in fact pleaded sufficient facts to establish that the violation of the rights under the Convention on the Rights of the Child as a result of the state's carbon emissions were reasonably foreseeable and they have personally experienced significant harm. So this is very high thresholds that have been crossed. OK, so pity the committee then basically said on the substantive points, we agree with you, but if you've not exhausted domestic remedies, um, sorry, exhausted the uh, route of domestic remedies, then you will not be able to uh, gain anything here. But it's laid out an important um, clarification, the principles of how children are affected. And this can have pretty uh, significant impact on how governments can act, because as we know, you know, every state in the world has children, uh, except I think the Vatican doesn't have children, I believe. Um, so. It's of relevance to various jurisdictions or rather all of the jurisdictions. So this is the um, what popularly known as the Torres Strait Islanders uh, case, which was decided um, in 2022 by the UN Human Rights Committee. This is Daniel Billy uh, and Australia. The outcome in this case um, and the causes of action is, you know, explained pretty much clearly when you look at the outcome. Um, the Australian government was violating the human rights obligations of the indigenous Torres Strait Islanders through climate inaction. So this was an omission by the Australian government. But then what kind of human rights? So, so far we looked at, uh, you know, the example of right to life, right to food, right to um, a healthy environment, right to health, etc. But now we've got the right to culture. So. What they said was the adverse impacts of climate change violated the Taurus Islanders right to enjoy their culture and be free from arbitrary interference with their private life, family and home. Yeah. So now we've got the right to culture of a community, a collective human right. OK, since we've got five types of human rights. With different levels of protection and different levels of enforcement. So civil and uh, political rights are certainly more strongly protected than socioeconomic cultural rights, which are collectively known as the you know, positive human rights or uh, the second generation of human rights. And then you've got what's known as collective rights. Yeah, so right to culture is a collective right. Unlike, let's say, right to food, right? I eat food, it's only for me, but right to culture, language. I can't speak a language just to myself, right? So at least there needs to be another person. But ideally, language grows when you have a community. So that's the sort of stuff when we talk about enjoying the right to culture. For the first time, a United Nations body has found the country violated international human rights law through inadequate climate policy. The UN Human Rights Committee is actually uh, one of the most influential bodies for human rights at the international level. And it's interesting to see how the um, 2022 case laid out direct links between you know, climate inaction by governments and its impact on human rights. The planet and Bolsonaro. 
before you get too excited, the planet is not really the Earth somehow representing itself. <laughs> it's a non-governmental organization that, you know, um, rights to nature, advocates, etc. So that's just party A um, against Bolsonaro. So this was in 2021. Look at how the uh, cause of action has been shaped. You know, very interesting and very off the wall, very, very different. So directly is against the former Brazilian president, Jair Bolsonaro, as an individual. Now, where is this coming up against? This is the International Criminal Court. So this was a request that was filed for an investigation into the actions of the former Brazilian president. And what was being uh, alleged? The, the planet wanted the role of Jair Bolsonaro in the way he conducted policy and resulting in deforestation and other related activities in the Amazon rainforest. So what they said was his policy was so bad that he's uh, committed a crimes against humanity. And according to the Rome statute under which the International Criminal Court is being established, crimes against humanity is an offence, is an international offence that can be um, uh, brought against a uh, anyone who has promulgated policy, if you can bring that link. So it's very interesting and quite radical to look at, you know, environmental crime as a crime against humanity. And what did they argue? They said the former president has promoted and facilitated widespread attack on the Amazon biome, as well as those who are defending the Amazon biome and those who depend on the Amazon for their livelihood. So this in itself represents a clear threat to humanity because the Amazon is so important in the context of global climate change because the, it acts as a carbon sink. It holds back and it holds in a lot of carbon dioxide. So global climate security is dependent on the Amazon. You know, there's very other few other places that can have this claim, but they thought that Amazon can have this claim. And it is supported in the science literature around the role that the Amazon actually plays, because it does play a key role in regulating global temperatures and the weather pattern. So because of his actions of deforestation, there was severe damage to these functions. So not only deforestation, but also conversion of the deforested land to cattle ranching. So cattle again give, you know, um, emit uh, methane and then uh, also Mm, vast intentional forest fires. So a whole range of activity which they say has amounted to a crime against humanity and it's resulted in the Amazon rather than being a carbon sink to becoming a carbon source, meaning it, you know, because of these actions, it's emitting out carbon dioxide. Um, but the procedures of the ICC, uh, they take its course. So the office, the prosecutor, what must they do first? They must conduct an analysis looking at the information. They have to determine whether this case can even be taken up. Is there a reasonable basis to proceed against Bolsonaro on the charge of crime against humanity for having you know, put in place policies that led to the destruction of parts of the Amazon? Right. So as you can imagine, it's quite a radical cause of action, so it's still being investigated. It's something that you can keep track of if you're interested. Center for Food and Adequate Living Rights and Tanzania and Uganda, a 2020 case. So this is the case in the East African Court of Justice. The, um, uh, this relates to a pipeline um, that is being proposed. So what the NGO is claiming is that the governments of Tanzania and Uganda, and also the Secretary General of the East African Community, because um, they did not object, uh, they are responsible for the oversight of the East African Community Treaty, which is enabling this new pipeline. They didn't object as well. So they're saying Tanzania, Uganda, as well as the Office of the uh, Community Treaty, 
they have signed agreements to build the pipeline without proper environmental, social, human rights and climate impact assessments. There has been a uh, temporary injunction on this, so the pipeline hasn't uh, uh, is not being constructed. There is an injunction, so the outcome of this is, however, pending. But you can see how different areas of law are coming together. Under environmental law in the region, you can conduct environmental impact assessment. But what the um, party is claiming is that that is probably not going to be sufficient to show the impact on climate. Then added to that, they're looking at what the impacts are in terms of human rights. And on top of that, they're looking at how the pipeline might have an impact on uh, the climate goals, both of the countries in question. So if you look at the Tanzania and Ugandan NDC, how do they propose to um, mitigate any results com coming from the construction of the pipeline? Yeah. So these are all uh, part of what they would be uh, looking at and arguing for, saying there's, you know, the plans have simply not been thought through and this is going to have an adverse impact on um, on uh, the the atmosphere as a whole. Coming closer home, this is um, the city of Paris and others at the European Commission. OK, so they are uh, sorry against the uh, European Commission at the court of uh, the European Commission. This is a 2022 case. Uh, this is a case brought by subnational parties, City of Paris, City of Brussels and the municipality of Madrid. They bring an action against the European Commission. So as you may be aware, the members of the European Union, their laws, especially on environment and climate, are highly integrated. So they are all the within the competence of the uh, European Union laws. So they challenge a regulation establishing a new procedure for testing the real driving emissions of certain motor vehicles. You know, the methodology, how it's being tested. And the cities are arguing that the regulation will prevent them from imposing restrictions on the circulation of passenger vehicles in relation to the air pollutant emissions that come out from these vehicles. So what they're saying is they want to lay out strict restrictions on certain types of vehicles, but a European Union regulation will prevent them from exercising that power they have. So it went through two courts, the General Court first in 2018. They partially upheld that action. Now, there was an appeal from this, went on to the Court of Justice of the European Union. So in 2022, the CJEU ruled in favor of the European Commission. Why? Because according to how the law is laid out, the cities do not have a direct concern in this matter. So again, questioning the standing of the city to lay this out. If it may have come from the European Union, uh, perhaps the wording may have been different. But they said that uh, the city of Paris, the city of Brussels and the municipality of Madrid did not. The issue of regulating the movement of the uh, passenger vehicles and calculating the emissions in a certain way is not something that uh, official within their uh, legal capacity. They have a direct concern about. Yeah. So they did overturn what the general court said, um, because according to the general court, the cities were prevented from exercising their powers to regulate the circulation of passenger vehicles. However, they found uh, differently. Another interesting um, citation here. It's not human being, it's humane being. Again, another organization, a non-state actor. Humane being um, versus the United Kingdom. There have been quite a few cases in the UK. We've had cases around, you know, Heathrow Airport expansion. We've had cases around, uh, you know, an extra license for an uh, onshore um, oil drilling operation, etc. But this one is very interesting because it really stretches um, the argument. So the applicant. Uh, alleged that the United Kingdom is in breach of its obligations under the European Convention of Human Rights, ECHR, 
for failing to address the risks of the climate crisis, future pandemics, and antibiotic resistance created by factory farming. Now, you might wonder what is the connection between all of this? Pandemic, antibiotic, and factory farming? Well, that's why I said it was novel, because their arguments were quite novel in this. And mainly, they argued that focusing on the danger of agricultural methane emission. And they highlighted the soya feed consumption in factory farming in the UK. And these both were actually drivers of deforestation in the Amazon basin. So they were going all over the place, establishing the causal link. So they, they were trying to say that because of how the globalized you know, eco agricultural economy works, there are certain routes which are detrimental for states to implement their adaptation policy. It's a logical argument, but from a legal point of view, it needs to cross quite a few barriers to be able to be accepted um, as an argument uh, for uh, climate as a climate obligations argument. But let's see how that goes and what the um, uh, courts thinking around this process might be as well. OK, so uh, there have been quite a few cases just to give a snapshot of some other ones. Brazil Supreme Court held that the Paris Agreement is a human rights treaty which enjoys supranational status. So this is the first we're hearing about the Paris Agreement as a human rights treaty. The Paris Agreement is certainly an environmental treaty, and it's more specifically a climate change treaty. But the Supreme Court holds that it is also a human rights treaty. A Dutch court ordering uh, the oil and gas company Shell to comply with the Paris Agreement and to reduce its carbon dioxide emissions by 45 percent from 2019 levels by 2030. This is pretty unusual because first time a court has found that a private company has a duty under the Paris Agreement. Yeah, the Paris Agreement is really for states. However, they uh, Shell is not a party to the Paris Agreement. Nevertheless, the Dutch court has found that it has an obligation. So you can see now how there is um, quite a wide variety of outcomes and judgments that are being given. On the one hand, you find that a lot of procedural law seems to be, um, you know, prohibiting uh, outcomes in substantive aspects, you know, such as exhaustion of domestic remedies or um, looking at whether it's directly within the remit of that subnational party, etc. But on the other hand, you have, you know, mm, quite nearly wacky decisions being, you know, given uh, by by the courts which is very interesting. Uh, Germany's court striking down parts of the Federal Climate Protection Act as incompatible with the rights to life and health. Some of these actually are very, um, uh, you know, uh, impactful in their, um, uh, um, in their effect. So, you, you know, this example, because the Federal Climate Protection Act is the flagship legislation in Germany and to address uh, climate change, you know, its uh, targets, etc. And it's quite, um, you know, quite symbolic as well as quite um, uh, important that the, uh, you know, a large uh, country, uh, one of the most important countries in the European Union is developing this jurisprudence linking environmental um, or climate change obligations with human rights obligations, because that has ripple effects around, you know, the uh, regional court uh, jurisprudence as well as the uh, other states uh, courts. A court in Paris holding that the France's climate inaction and failure to meet its carbon budget goals have caused climate related ecological damages. So that linkage to the harm that's caused Rather than just talking about, you know, you haven't reduced emissions, but if it's directly linking it to 
ecological damages, which is not damage to the whole climate system, but it's saying it's an environmental damage. That also is quite beneficial uh, to address the larger uh, issue of uh, the climate system. A United Kingdom court finding that the government has failed to comply with its legal duties under the Climate Change Act when approving its net zero strategy. So essentially talk, saying you've got an act, but the strategy that you've got to fulfill the obligations under the act are not at all uh, sufficient. Yeah, so uh, that is uh, very important to do. It's not enough if you just say I have, you know, the target of net zero for 2050, but I also need to show that I have a pathway. I have a strategy that will lead me to that goal. Um, OK, so with that. Look at the different cases. Let's cast our mind to this issue of. OK, violations have been found, but what is the relief? What is the nature of relief that's been granted by the courts? Because that's going to help us understand more towards how uh, we can achieve Article 2 of the Paris Agreement. So enforcement of existing climate laws. So they said, look, you've not enforced it, so you've got to enforce it. The second has been integration of climate action into existing environmental, energy and natural resource law. So rather than you know throwing a case out saying, oh, there's no cause of action, integrating it into other areas of law. So giving it much more of a uh, integral space, which is again moving, you know, the uh, uh, the legal response to climate change in the right direction. Orders to legislators, policymakers, business enterprises to be more ambitious and thorough in the approaches to climate change. Okay. So naming all these sectors and their obligations and asking them to be braver, to be more ambitious. Establishment of clear definitions of human rights and obligations affected by climate change. So certainly scoping out different legal concepts in the context of climate change, as they've done in the context of human rights, is very beneficial so that you know, the parties are able to uh, clearly ask for relief based on um, the accepted definition. Compensation for climate harms. So this is all the different types of relief that has been granted by the courts. So what do we think about these relief? So if this is the relief, how does it help achieve Article 2 of the Paris Agreement? Yes, the states have obligations. Yes, they have to have policy. They have to raise ambition. Yeah. But what are those obligations? OK, you could say if they have not kept the obligation, then whatever damage has been caused, they have to provide a compensation. But what is the nature of that remedy? Is it that they're saying the parties have to be put back to the position that they were before the damage actually occurred? So just looking at some of the basic principles of damage and compensation. Or are we saying the earth has to be put back to where it was before the damaging emissions? Right. So rather than saying, well, you just implement your climate policy, should this courts take one more step further or go beyond that to say, you have to make sure you're putting the earth in the place where it is. So the 1990 levels, you've got to go to that, right? Rather than saying just implement your policy because that makes a difference. So does it help achieve uh, Paris Agreement um, Article 2? Or are the types of relief that's being, being given by the courts only reinforcing what is already said in Article 2? Yeah, because there's a difference. Saying that you have to further your policy, you have to raise your ambition, you know, it can be argued that it only reinforces Article 2 uh, of Paris Agreement and doesn't really implement Article 2 of Paris Agreement. So maybe what the court should really be doing is to directly put a stop to the activity that provides emissions, right? So for example, can an emitter's license to operate be withdrawn? Or what other ways in which the emissions can be directly addressed in each and every court, okay? 
So is it, you know, the victories that we achieve in the cases, wherever there are victories that are achieved, okay? Um, is it just a Pyrrhic victory? Yes, we've got a victory, but really it doesn't bring us that much benefits from it. That's one way of analyzing, you know, the impact of climate lit litigation. But let me remind you, according to the IPCC, they say with medium confidence that the policies are getting better. So if you don't have all of these, then you don't, you know, you're going to have policies which lead us to four degree average global temperature rise, but now we have 2.7 degrees. But then I say, well, you know, a well that's not fully crossed is no good. You're still going to fall inside the well. All right, uh, finally, let's just look at the future of climate litigation. What does the latest UNEP report um, tell us? Um, before we go into that, uh, we haven't really taken a break today, have we? What time is it? Almost uh, 8 p.m. Almost 8 p.m. Um, OK, so what I'm going to do is um, give you a break right now um, and come back after 10 minutes and then we'll look at the last few slides. Yeah. Uh, thank you. All right, see you guys in a bit.
Okay, are we all back? I'm back here. Thank you. It's 10 minutes over, isn't it? Uh, I think it's seven minutes. Oh, <laughs> is it? Is. <laughs> okay, uh, let's say eight minutes, yeah. One minute more. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I'll give you your well earned one and a half more minutes. Right, that should be that. So what we're going to do is um, <coughs> look at uh, one more slide and then I'm going to give you a in-class um, activity. Right. So where do we see the future of climate litigation? So this theme of finding strong human rights linkages to climate change, I think, um, is going to continue. And um, that's also what the UNEP 2023 edition of uh, the Climate Litigation Review also says. What can we expect to see in the future? There would be more cases dealing with climate migration, cases that are brought by indigenous peoples, local communities, and others affected disproportionately by climate change. Case, cases addressing liability following extreme weather events, so loss and damage. Challenges in applying the science of climate attribution so you have the concept of the causal link, but already the concept of a causal chain is being uh, propounded. So uh, rather than saying this factory emitted and therefore there are forest fires in my uh, village. But instead of that saying, this factory emitted, it's not in my neighborhood, but it is the start of a causal chain which has many links, okay? So applying the science of climate attribution to find the legal cause effect relationship. A rise in backlash backlash cases against litigants which aim to dismantle regulations that promote climate action. 
So this could come from um, various angles. Uh, it could come from the usual sources of, you know, intimidation against, you know, uh, government action or uh, it could also come from um, other large emitters as well. And this could come in the form of counter cases. We've already seen the uh, impact of the ca backlash cases. Um, I mean, this is not a legal term, but it's a good way of understanding the uh, types of litigation. I've not covered some of the backlash litigation here. Um, it's been more focused on, you know, how can litigation uh, a positive action to achieve Article 2. But there could be action that's taken. So, for example, um, there's a treaty called the Energy Charter Treaty. This is a uh, multilateral treaty for countries to promote investment in um, energy uh, sources as well as production, refining, etc. The change, of course, away from fossil fuel intense uh, energy sources into renewable sources is affecting long term investment decisions of the companies that produce fossil fuel. So there there was a case RWE in Italy and they were given a compensation saying because the change of policy in Italy um, away from uh, supporting government policies that support investment in fossil fuels, there was a loss that was incurred. And that was then paid out from the public purse, something to the tune of, you know, 1.8, um, not sure if it was 1.8 billion, but it was a massive sum. So you can see that there's climate litigation um, that involves, you know, uh, laws and policies around climate, not necessarily to achieve Article 2, but it might also be used in other ways to. Um, you know, ensure uh, legitimate legal provisions, however, but not necessarily fulfilling and satisfying the ambition under Article 2. So there is a whole set of legislation, um, uh, you know, climate litigation is of that type as well. Right, so mm, expect to see a lot more climate litigation, not because of the you know, trend in the curve, as you saw from 2014 onwards up to 20, you know, uh, 2022, there's always been a there's been a steady increase of the uh, number of cases around um, the globe, but uh, also because there, uh, there, there may be new laws and policies that have to come as a result um, of the global stock take of the uh, need for the second iteration of the nationally determined contributions uh, and the ratcheting up mechanism in the mitigation plan and an automatic ratcheting up necessary for the adaptation as we see more and more impacts of climate change materialize. So it's because of both, because there is a rising trend and because there will be new policies which will be contentious uh, as we raise the ambition. So both of these will uh, lead to more of climate litigation in the future. OK. Um, In-class activity. Now, if you research climate litigation, there's one case that was quite seminal which set the trend going for climate litigation. And that's the case that the a foundation in Netherlands called Urgenda brought against the government of the Netherlands. So what you're going to do now is um, listen to a summary of the judgment that's given by the Dutch Supreme Court. Take your notes from it, OK? Um, this is about 17 minutes long, roughly. OK, so 
uh, have a pen and paper ready or have something handy where you can take notes because I'm going to ask you to discuss afterwards. Give your observations on any aspect of the judgment that was uh, pronounced in this case. OK, so I'm going to start this and I'm going to play. So. screen of all right so this is the website of the organization this is their flagship uh, case so you can look at the timeline the action was first started. They approached the government saying you're not discharging your climate obligation. That was in 2012. And it progressed through the different courts. The district court went on to the Hague Court of Appeal and then finally went on to the Supreme Court and it was decided in 2019. A point to note over here is also about if you were using the court system to uh, push for better ambition, better realization of Article 2 or fuller realization of Article 2, then you also have to think about how long it takes for decisions to come through. And given that the whole nature of climate change law is that we are chasing uh, a target within a particular period in time, that's quite an unusual uh, situation to be in in law, right? We need to ensure that rights are fulfilled, but we also need to ensure they're fulfilled within a certain period of time. You know, something that um, is, is, is quite a difficult and a challenging task for courts uh, to do in terms of what is the speed necessary for uh, dispute resolution to take place in uh, climate change law is a key question. And an illustration over here is how long it takes. It has taken for the uh, Urgenda decision to be given. So on this page, you find a summary if you want to read a version um, without going into the full uh, judgment. You've got a summary of it here, the District Court of Hague, the Court of Appeal, the Supreme Court, and what you're going to watch is just this. Right, so now I'm going to see if. Uh, in a way, it doesn't matter so much that you're not able to hear it because it is being rendered in Dutch. What is really important is that you see the um, subtitling that is in this video. So I'm going to play it and. in het bijzonder het CO2 verder te beperken dan uit de voornemens van de Nederlandse regering voortvloeit. De vorderingen van de agenda roepen lastige en veelomvattende. Sorry. Oops. Een klimaattechnische vraag. De rechtbank beschikt zelf niet over deskundigheid om dit te rijden. Zij gaat uit van de feiten waarover de beide partijen het op zich eens zijn. Het gaat dan zowel om de huidige stand van de wetenschap als om andere gegevens die de staat heeft erkend of ook zelf voor juist te houden. Het eerste onderdeel van het oordeel van de rechtbank houdt in dat de agenda, voor zover zij wel opbreid ontvankelijk is in haar vordering. Dit betekent dat zij in de positie verkeert om deze zaak aan de rechtbank voor te leggen. De rechtbank kan de zaak dus in volle omvang inhoudelijk oordelen. De rechtbank ziet in deze zaak vervolgens drie hoofdvragen die het zal doen. De eerste vraag, wat is de ernst van het probleem? De omvang van het gestelde gevaar van klimaatverandering. De tweede vraag, heeft de Nederlandse staat tegenover de agenda een rechtsplicht om met het oog op het gestelde gevaar van klimaatverandering 
verdergaande productiemaatregelen en interesse. En de derde vraag, de derde hoofdvraag, die aan de orde komt als vraag 2, bevestigt een kort beantwoord, is dit wel een zaak die het recht zou thuis worden? Ten aanzien van de eerste vraag die over de rest van het probleem van klimaatverandering oordeelt de rechtbank als volgt. In de klimaatwetenschap wordt in elk geval sinds 2007 breed aanvaard dat de menselijke uitstoot van broeikasgassen, vooral CO2, door de verbranding van fossiele brandstoffen zoals kolen, olie en gas, het hoogst waarschijnlijk maakt dat binnen enkele tientallen jaren een gevaarlijke klimaatverandering optreedt met onontkeerbare ernstige gevolgen voor de mens en het milieu. Deze klimaatverandering brengt op bij een wereldwijde temperatuurstijging van meer dan 2 graden Celsius ten opzichte van het basisjaar 1850. Het gevaar bestaat onder meer hierin dat de zeespiegel zal stijgen, dat de woestijnen zich zullen uitbreiden en dat door de hitte vele diersoorten zullen sterven. Voor de mens leidt dit tot een aanpassing van de voedselproductie en tot hittesterfte, vooral bij ouderen en kinderen. Door de stijging van de zeespiegel en verhoogde rivierafvoer zullen ook in Nederland vaker gevaarlijke situaties ontstaan. Ook bestaat er een groter risico op verzilting in de kustzones en op verbindering van zoetwater dat geschikt is voor de landbouw. Om te voorkomen dat de temperatuur van met meer dan 2 graden stijgt, is een wereldwijde verbindering mitigatie van de broeikasgasuitstoot nodig. In de wetenschap is aanvaard dat als de concentratie van broeikasgassen in de atmosfeer stabiliseert op het zogenoemde 450 niveau en op zijn best een redelijke kans 66% is dat de zogeheten 2 graden doelstelling wordt gehaald. Ik laat de technische opschrijving van wat dat 450 niveau precies is voor het gemak even naar de beschouwing. Uit deze wetenschappelijke bevindingen volgt dat de geïndustrialiseerde landen, aangeduid als de Annex 1 landen in de zin van het VN-klimaatverdrag, waaronder Nederland, hun uitstoot in het jaar 2020 met 25 tot 40 procent moeten hebben verminderd ten opzichte van 1990. Het staat vast dat de wereldwijde uitstoot nog altijd toeneemt en dat de beoogde reductiedoelstellingen niet worden gehaald. Onder de gegeven omstandigheden staat daarmee vast dat er een gevaarlijke klimaatverandering zal ontbreken. Nederland heeft de 2 graden doelstelling aanvaard. Met de huidige doelstellingen voor 2020 zal de reductie in Nederland uitkomen op ten hoogste 17 procent. En daarmee dus onder de in de klimaatwetenschap en het internationale klimaatbeleid ook zakelijk geacht worden van 25 tot 40 procent voor het jaar 2020. De conclusie van de rechtbank ten aanzien van de eerste hoofdvraag is dan dat het om een ernstig probleem gaat en dat een wereldwijde vermindering van de uitstoot noodzakelijk is om het dreigende gevaar van een onontkeerbare klimaatverandering te voorkomen. Wetenschappelijk gezien is het nodig dat Nederland als geïndustrialiseerd land zijn uitstoot in 2020 met 25 tot 40 procent van hebben verminderd ten opzichte van het jaar 19. Dan de tweede hoofdvraag die de eventuele rechtsplicht van de staat tegenover de agenda aan de orde stelt. De rechtbank beantwoordt deze vraag aan de hand van wat wel genoemd wordt de open norm van artikel 162 van het proces van het burgerlijk wetboek, onrechtmatig geduid. Hierbij houdt de rechtbank rekening met de beleidsvrijheid die aan de staat en zijn organen bij het bepalen en uitvoeren van overheidsbeleid, ook als het op het klimaat gaat. De rechtbank onderkent dat individuen, zoals degene voor wie de agenda opkomt en ook de agenda zelf, niet rechtstreeks een beroep kunnen doen op de internationale burgerverdragen die hier aan de orde zijn. Te denken is dat bijvoorbeeld aan het algemeen de VN klimaatverdrag. Aan de agenda zelf komt ook geen beroep door op de artikelen 2 en 8 van het Europees Verdrag voor de Rechten van de Mens. Maar internationale verplichtingen van de staat, andere bedragsbepalingen en richtlijnen van de Europese Unie, met de daaraan ten grondslag liggende beginselen, kunnen wel een rol spelen bij de invulling van de open norm 
kan er die komen van 62 dan ook 6 van het burgerlijk wetboek. Daarbij speelt ook het aspect van de gevaarzetting een rol. Wat moet de staat doen om het dreigende gevaar te keren? Bij de beginselen die hier aan de orde zijn, gaat het papier om die van artikel 3 van het VN Klimaatverdrag. Hier horen het billigheidsbeginsel, het voorzorgsbeginsel en het duurzaamheidsbeginsel. Het billigheidsbeginsel houdt er al meer in dat een extra inspanning is voor reis van de landen die tot nu toe de meeste broeikasgassen hebben uitgestoken en daarvan ook het meest hebben geprofiteerd. Daarnaast volgt uit het billigheidsbeginsel dat rekening moet worden gehouden met de toekomstige generaties. Op artikel 191 lid 2 van het verdrag betreft de werking van de Europese Unie houdt enkele beginselen in die in deze zaak belangrijk zijn. Zoals het beginsel van een hoog beschermingsniveau en ook hier het voorzorgs- of preventiebeginsel, kort gezegd, voorkomen en het beter dan geneest. De staat wijst dat terecht op dat hij geen mede veroorzaker van de uitstoot is. Maar dat is niet beslissend. Ten eerste geldt dat op grond van artikel 21 van de grondwet de zorg van de staat gericht moet zijn op de bescherming en verbetering van het leefmilieu. Zorgplicht. Dus. En ten tweede, de staat heeft het ook in zijn macht om effectief controle uit te oefenen op het Nederlandse emissieniveau. De staat speelt dus een cruciale rol in de overgang naar een duurzame samenleving. Dus het is ook niet dat een geringere uitstoot in Nederland maar een klein effect heeft op de wereldwijde uitstoot. Elke uitstoot draagt immers bij aan een verhoging van het totale niveau van de CO2-concentratie. En geen enkel land, klein of groot, kan zich verschuilen aan het argument dat het niet alleen van zijn inspanningen afhangt, maar de klimaatverandering wordt voorkomen. Bovendien is Nederland als annex 1 land een van de landen die hierin voorop moet lopen. Uit het in deze zaak gevoerde debat en de wetenschappelijke rapporten die in algemene zin de staat worden beschreven, leidt de rechtbank af. Dat een reductiedoelstelling van 25 tot 40 procent in 2020 ten opzichte van het jaar 1990 uit kostenoogpunt niet onmogelijk of wereldkanijs onaanvaardbaar is. Voorzorgsmaatregelen met een dergelijk effect zijn dus niet zonder meer te bezwaren. De ernst en de omvang van het klimaatprobleem maken het noodzakelijk. Ze geven ook het feit dat effectieve andere oplossingen voor het probleem voor ons nog ontbreken om op korte termijn mitigatiemaatregelen te nemen en niet te wachten op maatregelen die pas later werking zullen hebben. De keuze en beleidsvrijheid van de staat bij de uitvoering van zijn publieke taak moet hieraan niet wezenlijk af. Naarmate het te keer dat gevaar groter en klemmender is, wordt de vrijheid in ons klein. En hier gaat het om een aard en omvang. Tot welke noodzakelijke reductie leidt dit in deze zaak? De rechtbank heeft rekening gehouden met de harde en door Nederland eerder ook onderschreven doelstellingen. Maar zij moet ook de vrijheid van de staat respecteren om zijn eigen afwegingen, zijn eigen beleidsafwegingen te maken. In deze situatie acht de rechtbank binnen de genoemde bandbreedte van 25 tot 40 procent een reductie tot het niveau van de ondergrens. In beginsel geboden. Dit komt neer op een vermindering in de uitstoot van ten minste 25% van het jaar 2020 ten opzichte van het jaar 1990. De rechtbank heeft onder ogen gezien als de verplichtingen van Nederland in het verband van de Europese Unie op grond van de ETS-richtlijn over de handel in emissierechten niet tot een ander oordeel zouden moeten leiden. Deze richtlijn staat bij het oordeel van de rechtbank echter niet in de weg aan het treffen van verdergaande reductiemaatregelen. Ook andere aan deze richtlijn gebonden EU-landen, zoals Duitsland, het Verenigd Koninkrijk, Denemarken, hebben in hun nationale beleid doelstellingen aanvaard die uitgaan op de percentages die aan hen in het verband zijn gesteld. Ook staat het helemaal niet vast dat een strenger klimaatbeleid tot een ernstige verslechtering van de concurrentiepositie of vertrekking van bedrijven leidt of in Europees of internationaal verband onvoldoende effect zou hebben, zoals de staat onze gevaren heeft genoemd. Maar ook als dat in de mate van de betekenis wel het geval zou zijn, wordt het onvoldoende grond om aan te nemen dat Nederland zijn zorgplicht niet schept. 
rechtbank beantwoordt de tweede deel wat we nog nog mogen vragen, dus in deze zin op de staat rust tegenover de agenda in beginsel, dat wil zeggen, afgezien van het antwoord op de volgende derde vraag, de rechtsplicht om te bewerkstelligen dat de uitstoot in Nederland in het jaar 2020 wil zijn gereduceerd met tenminste 25% ten opzichte van het jaar 1990. Anders gezegd, het berusten in een geringere reductie is onrechtmatig tegenover de agenda. <lacht> Dan kom ik toe aan de derde hoofdvraag in deze zaak. Die gaat over het delen van bevoegdheden binnen de staatsmacht of wel de trias politica. De VV zal de vraag opkomen of deze kwestie wel geschikt is om te worden beslist door de niet gekozen rechter. De staat stelt dat het hier in wezen om een politieke kwestie gaat die in deze vorm niet in de rechtszaal thuis voert. De rechtbank overweegt hierover als volgt. De Nederlandse recht kent geen volledige onderscheiding van staatsmachten, in dit geval tussen de uitvoerende macht en de rechterlijke macht. Het is beter om te zeggen dat de verdeling van bevoegdheden tussen deze twee organen en de wetgevende macht tot doel heeft om een evenwicht tussen de staatsmachten te bereiken. Daarbij heeft niet de ene macht in algemene zin voorrang en in alle gevallen voorrang over de andere. Wel heeft elke staatsmacht haar eigen opdracht en verantwoordelijkheid. De rechter biedt rechtsbescherming en beslist in rechtsgeschillen. Hij moet dit ook doen als dat van hem wordt gevraagd. Het is een wezenlijk kenmerk van de rechtsstaat dat ook het handelen van zelfstandig democratisch gelegitimeerde en gecontroleerde politieke organen kan en soms zelfs moet worden beoordeeld door de onafhankelijke rechter. De rechter treedt daarbij niet in het politieke domein met de daarbij behorende afwegingen en keuzes. Hij moet zich los van iedere politieke agenda beperken tot zijn domein, de toepassing van het recht. Voor toewijzing van het in deze zaak gevormde bevel door de rechter kan plaats zijn op de hoogte van de wettelijke taak van de rechter om rechtsbescherming te bieden tegen dreigend onrechtmatig handelen, ook in zaken tegen de overheid. Wel moet de rechter terughoudend zijn als het bevel zou leiden tot de rechtsmaatregelen met gevolgen voor derden. Voor de rechter die nog niet te overzien zijn. Maar ook hier geldt dat naarmate door de ernst van het gevaar de rechtsplicht van de overheid zwaarder is, er minder reden bestaat voor een terughoudende oordeel. Hoe dit ook zij, deze terughoudendheid vormt wel een aanvullende reden om het veld te beperken tot de wetstelling 25%. Het antwoord van de rechtbank op de derde bovenpaar is dus dat de trias politica geen beslissend tegenuitgebrengd oplegt. Hierbij heeft de rechtbank de drie hoofdvragen beantwoord. Op basis hiervan heeft zij de afzonderlijke vorderingen beoordeeld. De gevraagde verklaringen voor recht zijn niet toewijsbaar. De agenda heeft daarbij geen zelfstandig belang. Het gaat alleen maar in de kern om het reductiebevel. En dit is, zoals we zeggen, niet toewijsbaar voor een bepaalde percentage van de winststelling 25%. De vordering van de agenda bestrijkt op een bepaalde wijze van publicatie in het veld tot informeren zal niet worden tot opgezet. Gegeven deze uitkomst in de zaak van de agenda zelf, hebben de 886 individuele personen voor wie de agenda in deze zaak op grond van volmacht op, ook opkomt, een onvoldoende eigen belang bij conversie. De proceskosten komen ten laste van de staat. Bij de begroting van deze kosten werkt de rechtbank af van het gebruikelijk netten voor de advocaatkosten. Zij doet dit, doordat het een ingewikkelde zaak betreft, waarin grote maatschappelijke en financiële belangen aan de orde zijn, de rechtbank past het maximale voor het interne tarief toe. En de beslissing laat dan als volgt. De rechtbank veel staat om op de vordering van de agenda voor de ontleden voor zichzelf het gezamenlijke volume van de jaarlijkse Nederlandse investeringen van broeikasgassen zodanig te beperken of te beperken dat dit volume aan het einde van het jaar 2020 met tenminste 25% zal zijn verwinterd in vergelijking met het niveau van het jaar 1990. De rechtbank voordeel bestaat in de kosten van deze procedure aan de zijde van de agenda, ontleden voor zichzelf. En we gaan deze kosten op 13.521,82 euro. Op eerder met de wettelijke rechten daarover, vanaf de vierde dagen naar dit fonds. 
Dit alles is dat zo ver dat je voor waarde bent voor de mens. En dan heb ik ook een zeer proces kost voor het overheen in deze twintig partijen. En zo ver de eigen kost dragen. En wat meer of anders is gevorderd, wordt afgemaakt. Oké. Okay. Daarmee heb ik. Let's stop that there. Right. So hopefully you were able to follow that. As I said, it's a, a seminal case for climate litigation. One of the first ones at this scale. So it's a good one to get introduced to. OK, so can I invite whoever's comfortable to come on camera and Let's hear your comments on the notes that you took from the Urgenda case. Silence. Hello, Professor. Hmm? Hello. Uh -huh. uh, the question again? Your comments on the judgment that you just heard. Yeah, I didn't follow it properly. <laughs> Sorry? Well, to be honest, I didn't grasp it properly. So. You weren't able to read the subtitles? Uh, it was it was too fast. The subtitles were too fast. Oh, that's a shame. Yes, uh, hello, Professor. Hello. Uh, this is uh, Zahur. So I think yeah. uh, like the, the, the central question uh, which which I grasped around from the subtitle was uh, that whether the, the state had a duty to impose uh, mm -hmm. the further reduction on greenhouse gas emission uh, about the limits that has already been established. So the, the the Uganda pointed out like three main questions to 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 the to the court, which the court has satisfactorily answered and answered it in very detailed way. The court declared that Uganda could not rely on the European Convention on Human Rights, but they they refer to the constitutional part, and the court also determined that a state breached its duty of care under the Dutch Civil Code law. So, so uh, uh, like that require parties to take precautionary measures. So the court referred to the precautionary measure to mitigate the hazardous situation. And also like uh, the point that I have uh, noted, like uh, the court has mentioned that the state has a duty uh, to care for the for the future generation as well, uh, which they pointed out is the, the principle of the equity. Uh, and, and and also like uh, the, the, they refer to the international regulations and the court determined that whether uh, the, the, there is a um, overlapping relation between the legislative part and the executive part. So the court determined that uh, it is not like the, the overlapping effect. The court has the power to uh, determine all of these questions and the uh, Urgenda has the uh, uh, has the capacity to bring this case into the court of law. And the court has answered all these points for the Urgenda. OK, pretty well uh, captured. There's just a few gaps there, but. Um, OK, let's hear from Siddharth. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Uh, I don't remember exactly the questions, but there were three questions that the court uh, addressed. So I think the first one was whether Organda has this capacity to bring the claim and then uh, the second issue was uh, the limit to which the uh, Dutch government or Netherlands has to lower its emissions so they have to do it by 25 to 40 percent and the third issue was uh, whether the court is even capable of listening to this issue because it's more of a political matter that Netherlands said 
So with first regard, the court's decision itself is representation of the fact that Uganda had the standing and that it received what it basically was claiming for from the first instance. With mm-hmm. second issue, the court explained the overall significance of this problem of climate change. It gave the details about that it is a considered as a threat or a problem for entire planet or environment since 2007 and that we have to bring it to the levels of, uh, I think the year was 1865 or something uh, like that. And uh, mm-hmm. that we have to work together, especially the European Union has some obligations uh, with regards to emission, which each nation state has, and that Netherlands also has to follow those emission obligations. And by mm-hmm. 2020, it has to come to those levels. This was the second thing. And the third thing was with regards to its power to address these issues. So it's very specifically mentioned that the separation of power principles in Netherlands is not as strict, but there is always an overlapping. And uh, in such issues where the court has to protect the rights of the people, especially with regards to climate change, in that regard, the court takes this action, we can say uh, say it as judicial activism to protection of the people in general. So these three issues were discussed by the courts and the judgment was specifically given in favor of Uganda and Netherlands was expected to uh, do the needful in this regards. That was uh, understood. Mm -hmm. Excellent. They also got all the costs covered as well for Uganda, so which is good. Um, Because it's always a issue for um, uh, claimants, if they're individuals, if they're NGOs, what is the cost, right? The cost. Um, so overall, the costs as well are also in favor of Uganda, which is all, which is very good. Well, well, well understood. Um, that was good. Anyone else? I'd like to hear from a few people I haven't heard before. So let me ask. I don't think I've heard from Ada Dini. Pankaj, let me just come to you in a minute. Ada Dini, Ayumide? Sorry, Ayumide is your first time, is it? No, off to sleep. Right, Pankaj. Yes, Professor, I think this is a landmark case for the obligation of a government to to take a human right international human right law and this also help for the nation to de devaluate of their environmental policy and to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions i think mm-hmm. yeah certainly is definitely that's something about the significance of this case itself it propelled a lot of climate litigation as well. So it's got that distinction too. Okay. If we Michael, Michael Jones. Have you got any comments to make, observations around the case? Oops, Michael's even disappeared. <laughs> Let's try Jeshu. Jeshu, are you there? Oleg? Ah, Michael's back. Michael, any observations on what you've listened? Hello, Mike, can you hear me? Yeah. So sorry, I was about to mute and oh, I right. mistakenly clicked on left the meeting. Okay, so, um, well, basically, I was not able to catch the um, earlier comment of um, the court. Mm-hmm. Um, Yes, from the 
Uh, but um, towards the end, uh, mm -hmm. well, I, I don't think I would really be able to say much because I didn't really, I didn't really catch the earlier comments of the court. So I, I just, I right. just saw the end part. So I won't really be able to say much about what the court said in this circumstance. Okay. Hopefully, you'll go and click on the link and listen to it. Yes, definitely, time. definitely. Good. Um, right. Let me invite others then. Um, Daria, let me hear from you. Um, well, it's a really interesting case, and as far as you know, uh, Dutch. Um, government tried to appeal uh, this case in the Supreme Court, but uh, failed. And I find really reasonable that uh, the court decided to uh, reduce uh, this amount of uh, GHG uh, gases from uh, 40 to 25 since, uh, since uh, it is quite possible to reach this line and actually I hope that this solves a good example for other countries. So um, it's really interesting case. Thank you very much. Yeah, totally. I mean, if you guys noticed, the target is for, you know, 2050 in the international document. There's no mention of interim targets. It's only left to the nationally determined contribution. But in this case, the work court worked backwards, right? They said, if you have to reduce so much by 2050, then what do you have to reduce by 2020? What do you have to reduce by 2030? So that creating those interim legal obligations, yeah, it's a good function being performed by the highest court. Yeah, so that's something to note as well in terms of how we can have legal principles that develop at the national level um, because of the international framework. If the international framework wasn't there, it's not going to be that easy to develop the uh, national, the municipal legal obligation. And you will find in the NDCs that you read as well um, that states have passed laws which say that by 2030 we will achieve this much of emissions reduction. So 45% less than the um, 1990 levels. So why is this a useful um, thing to have? Is because it creates a certainty. It is good for the market responses. It's good for um, the economic activity to be regulated by this target. Because if we say by 2030, we have to do this much of reduction, then you can have um, a, a company saying we have to produce this many um, electric vehicles by this time. It gives them an incentive to be able to um, shape their business planning as well, right? And it also then impacts on individuals because if you know that um, there's going to be cheaper vehicles coming along, then you might consider there's more people who it's, uh, can consider uh, options of you know going electric for example or replacing their you know heating systems with something that uses renewable energy so more people can consider it given that there'll be you know incentives created by the policy for the market to expand and for prices to go down for all of these technologies uh, so this is something that <clears throat> decisions like this also help um, trigger Okay. <clears throat> right. Uh, any more thoughts overall? What did you uh, get from this lecture? Are you feeling the connection between this up to the first one? Since we are in the middle of the course and we're going to go into the second half of this module from the next uh, session onwards. Are there any topics you want to know more which you want covered? I think like uh, the, the the dots are now connecting like 
we first uh, cover the theoretical framework and now we are coming toward the practical aspect and the legal implications. So the dots are connecting like the course is not just about the theoretical framework and understanding of the climate change, but also of having the consequences and having the legal implication in the court cases. So being a, a practicing lawyer, it's now going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you for that. So there are a couple of directions we can take from here. OK, so one is um, to ask this question of, you know, effectiveness. How is the Paris Agreement shaping? So today we saw that the case law, um, this, this whole area of climate litigation has developed because of the uh, legal framework that's created from the UNF's uh, C. We can explore more aspects of the case law. We can look at um, case law in detail. Uh, we could go that direction. Or we can go back into the Paris Agreement and uh, ask the question, OK, if the uh, climate litigation is giving us some benefits, uh, clearly, it's not giving us all of the benefits. What are the other approaches? So one way is regulation, another is market forces, right? So the judge in this case referred to the ETS, yeah, the um, emissions trading system, which is a European market approach to making emissions a currency and then setting up a framework for trading this, um, trading in this currency, meaning that you can actually buy credits if you are high emitting and if you're not able to cut down, you will be able to get some credits from another company, which then you know uh, takes money from you, but gives you their carbon credits or the emissions that they have been able to reduce over and beyond their obligations. So that way you start creating carbon pricing and we can look at to what extent this sort of a market approach, which we you know, saw as part of the Paris Agreement as well. It talked about uh, market approaches. Um, so where is what direction is that going to get to know more about carbon markets, uh, but also carbon taxes? So that's another for a regulatory tool that the government has, because if you want to regulate um, activity, you do it through the system of taxation. So there is uh, like trends in Sweden, in uh, other countries where they've imposed a carbon tax um, or even in states, you know, like the state of California, uh, those uh, subnational bodies that have uh, lawmaking powers themselves, depending on the nature of that country, they have passed carbon taxes. So you've got carbon pricing and you've got carbon taxes. We can look in that direction and see what is the effectiveness, what is the role and place for emissions reduction through these uh, market-based approaches, OK? Um, and we can look at um, the other provisions of uh, the um, uh, Paris Agreement to go deeper um, and look at the um, uh, mitigate, uh, sorry, adaptation provision, loss and damage. So we'll dig deeper into all of that. And some of these concepts will also feature if we look at the case law route. So if you go and look at the different, you know, further look at the case law, um, and look at more of case law and look at more of the case law in more of in depth, then some of these themes may feature there as well. So there's two, we are at the crossroads. So you're going to, help me decide which route you want to go more into, right? I've got material for all of the routes, but given that we've got only another five more sessions, there is way more to cover than can be covered in these five sessions. Right, so let's go for a vote. OK, let's see how many people go in the direction of um, more case law. You can uh, 
you can put yes in the chat and I'll consider that that is for case law. More case law. OK. I have one vote. Oh, OK. <laughs> one, two, three, four. I have four votes. I have five votes. OK. I'm going to close this voting in another second. <laughs> no sitting on the fence. <laughs> we are flexible. <laughs> Is that uh, an abstention from the voting process? <laughs> right. So who's saying more looking at market approaches, other parts of the Paris Agreement? Nobody. Right. I've got one board there. Anybody else? Well, you also have to step back. Well, today's session was looking at um, case law, so don't get, you know, fixated with that itself. I agree, it's really interesting. OK, so we have got, um, I think, equal interest in both. So um, what I will do then is to maintain the balance. Yeah, uh, because if case law was super effective, then we can really go down that route. You know, it is very interesting to discuss legal principles, to go in depth. But at the same time, we are looking at gaining a you know a full comprehensive knowledge about fulfillment or um, achievement of the paris agreement objectives yeah or the unfcc so from that perspective i think you need to know also about um the eu ets but not just from the eu ets perspective but from the whole idea of you know emissions rate the carbon markets and carbon taxes so what I'll do then is next week, I will go ahead and introduce you to that so you get a hang of that. And after that, we'll see how to come back to the case law and look at what other options there might be. OK, so are we are we happy with next week being the market approaches? We're fine with that, Professor. Yeah. OK. Excellent. All right, guys. So I think with that, we'll um, wind up today's session and I'll see you all back here in a week's time. And uh, well, have a great week and a weekend until then. Thank you very much, Professor. Goodbye. Yeah. Thank you, Can Professor. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Goodbye. Someone had a question? Yeah, this week. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Just Go on. Okay. Other yeah. people. So I have a question about our essay. So uh, I'd like to compare Germany and Russia, but uh, I speak German and Russian. So uh, can I use sources in these languages, not only in English, but in other languages? Is it possible uh, to make footnotes? Uh, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, um, I can manage a bit with, uh, you know, German. I can read it and understand, but, uh, you know, definitely not with Russian. So, but I don't want to exclude it because you're looking at national policy. If you're using another language source, then I don't mind if you give me heavy footnotes just in relation mm -hmm. to helping me understand, you know, reasonably what it is that you're dealing with. Yeah. Thank you. Because, uh, um... What about our Russian legislation? It's really interesting yeah, that yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's hard to find this in English, actually. So I'll make, no, don't worry uh, about it. Note. You can use definitely, uh, you know, Russian sources, Russian legislation, but enable me to understand, you know, because I need to mark you, so I need to know it. So that means you need to give me stuff in the footnotes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thank you.
excellent. So then, um, bye till next Tuesday. Yeah, <laughs> bye till next week.